Australians out this morning being warned we could be at war with China within the next three years. Nine Federal Politics reporter Rhys D'Alessandro has the details. Rhys, it's a pretty dire prediction. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And it's dire, all right. Seems World War III is on the way. Because there it was, screaming out of the front page of the Age and Sydney Morning Herald on Tuesday in the first of an alarming three-part series. With the two papers chorusing... Australia, Australia faces, faces the real, real prospect, prospect of a war with China within three years that, that could involve a direct attack on our mainland. That warning of imminent attack came with a comic book sketch of jets flying out of red China to bomb Australia. So, who was sounding the air raid alarm? A panel of five science and security experts assembled by the nine papers and by international editor Peter Harcher, who is a well-known China hawk. And featuring Peter Jennings, who's made a habit of predicting that conflict with China is coming. Jennings told readers... It really is all about China, China, China. And he added... This is not about 10 to 20 years. It's really three years. There was no contrary view and no shading of the possibilities. And the official sounding communique from the expert panel warning of war over Taiwan was just as definitive. We believe Australia faces the prospect of armed conflict in the Indo-Pacific within three years. The most serious risk is a Chinese attack on Taiwan that sparks a conflict with the US and other democracies, including Australia. All in all, it was extraordinary stuff, and it was instantly slammed by Paul Keating as... The most egregious and provocative news presentation of any newspaper I have witnessed in over 50 years of active public life. With the former PM and China Dove adding... The extent of the bias and news abuse is, I believe, unparalleled in modern Australian journalism. Paul Keating has always been good for a killer turn of phrase, but on the Today Show, Nine's Chris O'Keefe went in just as fast and almost as hard. But the reporting this morning is hysterical. Now, if you've got the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, who are the ones saying, oh, well, we could be going to war in three years, well, they're, they're funded by the Australian Defence Force, mm. Lockheed Martin, TALIS and Boeing. On Twitter, rival defence and China experts also lined up to give the claims a kicking with Professor Nick Bisley from La Trobe University tweeting... It's irresponsible journalism, hyperbolic scholarship and the three-year timeline at odds with any serious analysis of PRC interests, capabilities and incentives. And Tom Corbyn from the US Studies Centre was keen to point out schoolboy errors in this graphic of how the warring sides line up. This is simply inaccurate. The Philippines is a US treaty ally. Singapore is not. Guam and Diego Garcia are territories, not allies. And how did the nine papers make those mistakes? Seems they pinched the map from this German 2018 article on mounting tension in Asia, but added the errors themselves. Whoops. So, do all defence and China experts think China will invade Taiwan within three years and war is inevitable? Certainly not. The ANU's Professor John Blacksland told 2GB Drive... No, I don't. And that's because there's too much to lose. And it's also not China's MO. And plenty of other strategic experts, including US spy chief Avril Haines, agree that China is a threat, but they don't believe it wants war over Taiwan. And as for it coming within three years, Macquarie University's Adam Lockyer told MediaWatch... Is this possible? Sure. Likely, no. If war came soon, it would be by accident rather than design. We need to be careful not to become hysterically fixated with low likelihood, worst case scenarios. So, maybe those views got a look in on day two of Red Alert, when the Herald and Age followed up with this. How a conflict over Taiwan could swiftly reach our shores. But no. Instead, we got more alarming predictions from Jennings. Within 72 hours of a conflict breaking out over Taiwan, Chinese missile bombardments and devastating cyber attacks on Australia would begin. For the first time since World War II, the mainland would be under attack. So who is Jennings? He's a former defence official in Canberra who for a decade ran the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, or ASPE, which is funded by the Department of Defence, the US State Department and a bevy of international arms suppliers. And he's long been crying wolf on China, as Sky's Andrew Clonell was quick to point out. We awoke this morning to warnings in the nine newspapers that we we're about to be invaded by China. 
Well, the trouble is one of the experts quoted said three years ago there would be a war in six months. Can this lead to war? Well, I, I think there are a couple of flashpoints in the region, in the South China Sea and Taiwan, uh, which give rise to serious concerns about the prospect for military conflict in months, right? Not years, but in months. Jennings also told the Nine Papers confidently last year, amid concerns about a security deal between China and the Solomon Islands, that Chinese ships and aircraft were likely to arrive in the Solomons within weeks because the deal would absolutely lead to a military base. So, when Nine picked Jennings for the panel, they knew what they were getting. And they did not pick anyone who disagreed. As Dr Breck Stratting, director of La Trobe Asia, told Mediawatch... It's a shame the journalists didn't bother to seek out comment from experts with deep knowledge of either China or Taiwan. While the experts cover off different fields of knowledge, they are all running the same basic line about the threat China poses to Australia. And foreign relations expert Professor James Curran told Sky, while we certainly should be worried about China's sabre-rattling, the panel's conclusions were scaremongering. What does this group of experts know that most of the Western intelligence community does not. Uh, as I say, it is, of course, prudent to prepare for the worst, but we're having this kind of talk of Armageddon with all the visual imagery from the late 19th century uh, that, frankly, frankly, makes some of the Cold War imagery um, look rather quaint. Day three of Nye's Red Alert focused on what Australia should do to prepare for war, with the panel suggesting we double our defence spending from 40 to $80 billion a year, Consider hosting US nuclear missiles on Australian soil and bring back conscription. Cue another chorus of disdain from assorted experts, including the ANU's associate professor, Matthew Sussex. China hobbyist and war enthusiast Peter Harcher brings his Red Peril comic strip to a thrilling denouement, suggesting Australia brings back conscription and or hosts nukes. Sussex told Mediawatch... Fortunately, Australia has many experts, both outside and inside government, working hard on defence and security strategies that give us the capability to prevent wars, not assume they're inevitable. It's a shame Harcher didn't think to include their voices. So, what did Harcher and Nine have to say in the face of all this criticism? Essentially, that the risk of war is real, and it's a conversation we absolutely need to have. Or as the Herald editorial put it... In publishing the Red Alert series, the Herald believes that discussing Australia's preparedness or lack of preparedness for war is responsible journalism and important for democracy. Well, of course, it is responsible to discuss the threat of war with China. But was it discussed responsibly? Many experts on China and defence clearly believe it was not. And that is putting it mildly. And now, to trolls and other keyboard heroes. The fact that what I wore on Monday attracted obnoxious commentary on Twitter, foul, disgusting personal abuse that I wouldn't and couldn't repeat here, it was upsetting. That was the ABC's Lisa Miller last week, hitting back at the online trolls who abused her for wearing a skirt with a split, which, thanks to an unfortunate camera angle, allowed viewers to see up her dress. The trolls and their screenshots weren't the only target of Lisa's anger. That it then ended up online on some news sites where the photos and the abuse were republished made me angry. And which sites are we talking about? Let's see if you can guess. Sickening Twitter trolls hit a new low as their vile insults against ABC host Lisa Miller get disgustingly personal. Just plain gutless, Aussie Twitter users slam online trolls for sickening Lisa Miller comments. Yes, the Daily Mail and news.com.au. And did they republish a close-up image of Lisa's upskirt? You bet. And what about some of the vile insults? Yes, they gave them a run too, while telling us, of course, how awful they were. But when the ABC was asked for comment, the broadcaster let rip. If Daily Mail Australia and news.com.au were genuine in their concern about such behaviour, they wouldn't amplify it by republishing the comments they describe as vile and sickening, accompanied by a screenshot. With Michael Rowland adding the next day... The editors of both uh, websites should hang their heads in shame. Shame? Well, that's not going to happen. The Daily Mail did change the screenshot, but it did not remove the abusive tweets, and it then came back for a second click. 
Furious ABC News Breakfast anchor Lisa Miller unleashes angry blast on International Women's Day. Conspicuously absent, however, was the angry blast aimed at the Daily Mail. Executive editor Lachlan Hayward told Media Watch the trolling of public figures should not be swept under the carpet and he had no qualms covering the story. Frankly, it is not up to the censors in the ABC Communications Department to dictate what is news. And news.com.au, which cropped the screenshot and did remove the abusive tweets, agrees. Editor-in-Chief Lisa Muxworthy said in a statement... Choosing to not report on this issue or to ignore it sets a poor precedent. Well, maybe or maybe not, but republishing their hate is a no-no. As TV host Erin Molan, who's copped a lot of foul abuse herself, told Sky. You legitimise what these knobs are saying. When you write an article and when you repeat what they say, you're adding to the problem there. So, so don't give them a voice. So, who are these trolls and what can be done about them? We examined some of the accounts targeting Miller. They appear to be mainly men and anonymous, making it hard to shame them. But Twitter could surely close the accounts and target the owners if it wanted to. And some of the tweets last week, which made sickening references to Miller's body and even to rape, would breach any standard of moderation on any platform. Unfortunately, under its new owner, Twitter has little interest in taking action. Sadly, under Musk's leadership, Twitter has been eviscerated. He has fired 80% of the staff and left fewer than 20 full-time employees tasked with overseeing content moderation. And will Twitter get away with doing nothing? Maybe not. The European Union last week told Musk to hire more staff for human moderation ahead of new rules on policing content. And Australia's Communications Minister Michelle Rowland issued a more direct warning to Twitter in a letter last month saying... I assure you the Australian government is prepared to regulate should Twitter's declining Australian presence have a detrimental impact on the safety of users. Well, Minister, here is your chance. Maybe you could take it from here. But now to the Apple Isle and a change room commotion that got Tasmania talking. Girls getting changed, then in walks a man. That scary headline in Launceston's Examiner newspaper graced the top of the letters section, along with an explosive missive about the goings-on at the local swimming pool. Recently, while getting changed in the female change rooms with many young girls present, an adult male walked in and started to undress in front of the kids. According to letter writer Olivia Nettlefold, the man was forcibly removed by a child's father. But when pool staff were alerted... They shrugged and said there was nothing they could do because the person identifies as female. A scandal and a cover-up. The person accused of undressing in front of the kids was transgender. Not surprisingly, the letter was soon a hot topic across the state on ARN's Tasmania Talks. Claims a man has received a life ban from the Launceston Aquatic Centre for removing another man from the female change rooms. And when presenter Richard Perno got a sniff of the scandal, he demanded to know... Are there other such incidences that occur in other pools around Tasmania that we don't know of? It opens the gates to some rather disgusting events, doesn't it? And he added... I mean, it exposes a lot of potential misharm and also hurtful uh, situations that could go on if this situation is right. Yes, if the situation was right. So, was it? To their credit, the radio station checked with the Launceston Mayor's office and when the 11am bulletin ticked over, we got an answer. The contents of that letter um, have no basis in fact. No such incident occurred at that facility and they've expressed their disappointment that there was no efforts to check, as you mentioned, the veracity of those claims. The Launceston Mayor confirmed to Media Watch that Council had never received any complaints about trans women in the female change rooms and no man has ever been banned for removing a trans woman, as the letter suggested. So, red faces at the examiner, a public apology for misleading readers? No and no. But there was this, buried at the bottom of next day's letters page, a retraction of sorts where the paper assured readers it wasn't their fault. Unfortunately, we appear to have been misled. After inquiries with the letter writer, the examiner has concerns that the letter contained incorrect information. It has been removed from our website. But surely the paper should check incendiary claims before they're published. We note the examiner's editor, Mark Westfield, acted as campaign manager for controversial Liberal candidate Catherine Deves. 
We asked if support for her views influenced his decision to publish the claims and make them the headline act. He ducked that question and said he couldn't possibly check every letter, but he did concede... Clearly, I will be more vigilant in future in letters touching on sensitive issues like this one. Or as one of the Examiner's journalists, Molly Appleton, tweeted... We must do better when hitting publish. Maybe time to make Molly the editor. That's all from us for tonight. You can read statements on our website from Mark Westfield, The Daily Mail and news.com.au. And don't forget, Media Bytes, Thursdays on Facebook, YouTube and iView. But for now, until next week, goodbye. <laughs>